Hi, this is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Nash Tsunami podcast. This weekend, we were offering six conversations from Season 3, Episode 25, four from our review of Nash Drug Development in 2022 with Stephen Harrison, and two from our Extrasode, a summary of Madrigal Pharmaceuticals' presentation at this spring's Liver Connect meeting. In this discussion from the Liver Connect conference, Mazen Nouradine presents his views on pathophysiology and epidemiology in Nash, after which he answers questions from me related to clarifying some of the metabolic issues and also taking a look at what we can and cannot prove statistically. This podcast represents the views of the speakers and does not necessarily represent the views of Mandrigal. The content herein is for educational purposes only and should not be taken as medical advice. Now that noted, Surfing the Tsunami is delighted to share this program from Liver Connect Meeting and the insights of these key opinion leaders. A lot to think about here. So sit back, listen, enjoy, learn. And when you're done, join the dialogue on our LinkedIn discussion group. Hi, this is Roger Green, executive producer and host of the Surfing the Nash Tsunami podcast. Last month, we attended and recorded presentations that Drs. Mazen Nouradine and Marcelo Kugelmas delivered titled Emerging Concepts in Non-Alcoholic Steatohepatitis, or NASH. This presentation was developed and sponsored by Madrigal Pharmaceuticals. Today, I would like to share highlights of the two presentations along with segments from interviews I conducted with Drs. Nouradine, Kugelmas, and Naeem al during the conference. Please note, we have re-recorded some sections of Dr. Nouradine's presentation to improve clarity and eliminate background noise. The podcast represents the views of the speakers and does not necessarily represent the views of Madrigal. The content herein is for educational purposes only and should not be taken as medical advice. The first section of this podcast will include Dr. Nouradine's presentation, followed by our conversation that took place later that day. The second section will include Dr. Kugelmas's presentation, followed by our conversation that took place the following week. The last section is a brief discussion with Dr. Alcori, following up on some themes from the presentation. Let me take you back to the beginning of the presentation. If you wish to view the actual slides while following along, click the link that says Slides to view the presentation while listening. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Keith Miller from Madrigal Pharmaceuticals. We're pleased to support this program today on non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, presented by two people you know very well, Drs. Maz Norden and Marcelo Kukamas. We hope you find it to be an informative discussion and look forward to the discussion that it engenders. Maz and Nuruddin. So it's a true honor to be here today to talk about this pandemic and how things are emerging and the involvement of our understanding of the disease, especially as hepatologists and gastroenterologists. I think all of us at one point realized how much we don't know. I mean, today's example of talking about disparities is like, it was really eye-opening. Like, we don't have enough studies. We don't have clinical trials in Asia and, and, and Middle East. There's one study on NITs. There are very few. And what I'm alluding to is basically like the mechanisms that came throughout the years and as a hepatologist and gastroenterologist were eye-opening. We're talking today about emerging concepts on non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. I would like to start talking about definitions, epidemiology, and comorbidities. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is a spectrum. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease with the D is the entire spectrum. If you take out the D, you have this NAFL, which we used to call isolated steatosis or simple steatosis. And this is when you just have fat in the hepatocyte, in the liver cell, by 5% or more. The disease can then progress to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is on top of the steatosis, you get ballooning and inflammation. And this is a cell injury. And this is a problem because that can lead to the more advanced forms, which is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis with fibrosis. The fibrosis can be mild. We call it F1. But the real category that we like to focus on is the F2 and F3, which is significant fibrosis. And this is a really important concept in NASH. NASH with significant fibrosis, F2 and F3. And I want you to keep this in mind. Why? Because NASH and F2 and F3s is the group that correlates with morbidity and mortality. Of course, there's cirrhosis, and this is already too late, especially if it's decompensated. So again, I want to re-emphasize two things. The staging and grading. Grade point to steatosis, inflammation, and ballooning. And staging is also histology, but focus on fibrosis, F1, F2, F3, and F4. Like similar to other liver diseases we have been dealing with. If we talk about prevalence, 
we have data now showing that the prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is 25% of the population. And that can go up to 30% in South America and up to 31% in the Middle East. If your patients have type 2 diabetes, the prevalence of NAVL go up to 50%. So now almost half of type 2 diabetic patients have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. That's a big number. The other one that is very important is obesity. So 70 to 80% of obese patients have NAVL and up to 90% of morbid obese they have NAVL. Again, up to 90% of morbidly obese have NAVL. And if you combine type 2 diabetes with obesity, the numbers will even go higher. I now want to list the common condition associated with NAVL. And those are obesity, type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia, metabolic syndrome, very important, and polycystic ovary syndrome. And metabolic syndrome, I just want to remind you what is it. There are multiple definitions, but the most common one used is if you hit three out of the following. You have to have three conditions, either obesity or waist circumflex of 102 centimeters in men and 88 centimeters in women, two triglyceride of more than 150, three HDL less than 40 in men or 50 in women, four systolic blood pressure more than 130 or diastolic more than 85, or if the patient is on hypertensive medications, and five fasting glucose of 110 or greater. So if you had three out of five, you're good. I also want to talk about other conditions that we usually don't pay attention to that is associated with NAVL. One, hypothyroidism. Two, hypopituitarism. Three, obstructive sleep apnea. Four, hypogonadism. And five, psoriasis, the skin condition. I really want to re-emphasize on the bidirectional relationship between non-alcoholic fatty liver disease type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome. Why so? Because each one of them is standalone condition that make the other one worse. NAFLD, if a patient has NAFLD, they have a 2.25 times increase risk of type 2 diabetes. And indeed, if you have type 2 diabetes, that increases risk of NAFLD to get to fibrosis by the two to six times. So they feed each other in an unpleasant way. They hurt each other. Also, type 2 diabetes is associated with cardiovascular disease and increase its risk by 0.5 to 2 times, as well as chronic kidney disease by 2.5 to 3. Point times. On the other hand, NAFLD has similar increased risk up to 2 times increased risk of cardiovascular disease and 1.5 times risk of increased chronic kidney disease. Finally, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease increases the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma by 10 to 100 times. And going back to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in numbers, it affects 25% of the population. About 25% of those goes to NASH. About 25% of these NASH goes to cirrhosis. So now everyone is progressing. It's only 25% each time. And indeed, only minority go to hepatocellular carcinoma, about 1% to 4%. But what does that translate in terms of numbers? 25% of adults, they have NAFLD. 5 to 6% of adults have NASH, much less than 25%, but still a large number in the U.S. And 1 to 2% adults have cirrhosis of the U.S. population. That's a problem. And there actually have been modeling study that looked into the projection of NASH over time. So a study published years ago showed that this number will increase by the NASH number by 63% between 2015 and 2030. 63%. For instance, the cirrhotics will increase from 1.3 to 3.5 million. The F3 will increase from 2 million to 4.5 million. The F2 will increase from 3.4 million to 6.1 million. So here, if you take the F2 and F3 is going to be up from 5.4 million to up to 10.6 million people. That's a huge increase for the significant fibrosis of NASH patients. Also to re-emphasize on what's happening today, the data from our group showed NASH is the leading cause of transplantation on women. Other data show that NASH is the most crop growing cause of liver transplantation overall. And also NASH is one of the leading cause of increasing transplantation to the hepatocellular carcinoma. So a lot of things are increasing because of NASH. Most growing cause of transplant, most leading cause of transplant for HCC and in women. Problem after problem. would like to switch gear 
and a very important concept with pathophysiology. And the hepatocyte usually is cell without a lot of fat. It's less than 5%. But due to multiple factors, like transportation of fat from the adipose tissue, the microbiome effects, the hepatocyte might get filled with triglyceride and other toxic fat, and that accumulation of 5% or higher leads to a very important concept, which is lipotoxicity. Why lipotoxicity? What happens? The cells become ballooned, you start the apoptotic process to cell death, and there's a cascade of inflammations that leads to immune cell activation, activated sinusoidal endothelium, myofibrous blastic stellate cells, and you get reactive ductal cells. So that cascade of inflammation after the lipotoxicity is a problem. It's kind of wound healing process. But what that leads to usually is scar that happens in the liver, you get fibrosis and eventually cirrhosis. I've been getting asked about the thyroid hormone signaling in the liver, and few hepatologists are new to this concept. However, this idea has been around since the 50s. Indeed, our endocrinologists know very well that thyroid hormone signal is very important for regulating cholesterol in the blood via the liver, and indeed liver injury can impair this intrahepatic thyroid hormone signaling. And what that leads to is the accumulation of fat in the liver. And we'll talk in a little bit about that in more details, but I want to talk about that thyroid hormone pathway. So your thyroid gland secretes T4, and in the periphery, the T3 is the one that acts on cells. So let's see what happened in the liver. You get the T4, and I, as I told you, the T3 is the active form. In a healthy liver, you have T4 getting converted to T3 via the adenosine 1. Also, there is some conversion via the adenosine 3 to the inactive T3. We don't want that as much. So you see that in healthy liver, it's not as much. What happens in the injured liver, it's the opposite. This adenosine 1 pathway becomes less less relevant or less active versus going from the T4 to the inactive T3 becomes more prominent. And let's look now at the ratio, how we look at this impairment. If you have the T3 to RT3, which is the inactive, decreased, that means you're heading the wrong direction. So let's look in particular in the hepatic lipid metabolism and the role of thyroid hormones and thyroid hormone receptors. So here in the list, you have the functions of the thyroid hormones and the thyroid hormone receptors. De novo lipogenesis and thensesis. Let's talk about that for a second. You know that de novo lipogenesis is crucial for fatty liver. There's increase of that. So part of this pathway is you heard about enzymes like ACC and FASIN. Well, there are data showing that the T3 and thyroid hormones regulate the ACC as well as the FASIN. In terms of synthesis, the HMG coenzyme A, it's a major player and a major step in cholesterol metabolism. Indeed, it's thought that the thyroid hormones are one of the major regulators more than others for the HMG CoA. Let's move down. Fatty acid oxidation and mitophagy and mitochondrial biogenesis. So the Th beta plays a role on the free fatty acid oxidation into the mitochondria through beta oxidation. So it's involved in that process. And finally, cholesterol metabolism. The liver take cholesterol and try to convert it to bile acid and we dump it through the bile. So thyroid hormones and thyroid hormone receptors regulate part of this process. The crucial steps that involves the pathogenesis of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, such as de novo lipogenesis, fatty acid oxidation, the mitochondria, and cholesterol metabolism are affected and regulated by thyroid hormones and thyroid hormone receptors. And back to that, what you really want is the Th beta to target lipid metabolism in the liver and not the TH alpha. And now Roger Green interviews Mazen Nuruddin. Mazen, first of all, thanks for taking time out of what's already been an exceptionally busy day and you have a lot left to do to, to talk with us. Congratulations. Very nice job. Very well presented. I, I do have a couple of questions for you. One, keeping in mind, I'm not a science guy. I think you did a nice job of describing what happens in the liver. But the part before that where you were using your own body kind of as a way to explain where everything went and how things 
got from one place to the other. Can you walk me through sure, that? Sure, sure. Uh, Roger, it's always a pleasure to be here. One of the questions that came recently from a lot of hepatologists and gastroenterologists, why we're talking about thyroid hormone receptors, thyroid hormones in general, and the relation to the liver. As I said, it's a very known relationship mm-hmm. since the 1930s that thyroid hormones are crucial in regulating cholesterol levels and lipid metabolism in the serum and in the liver. Going a little bit back to the basics, the thyroid is in your neck where it secretes T4. The thyroid gland is regulated by something higher, the pituitary gland, which secretes thyroid simulating hormone or TSH, and the pituitary gland is regulated in the brain by the hypothalamus. The T3, which is the active form of thyroid hormones, it's in works in the cell, and there are receptors that are involved, receptors of TH alpha, which is called THR for abbreviation alpha, and THR beta. And as you know, receptors are involved in multiple parts of the body, and sometimes they exist in certain parts of the body and not in another part. And the part that THR alpha are in is the heart and bone. THR beta exists in the liver and the kidneys. Is T3 metabolized in all those places or just in the liver? So you get Yes, you get T3 in all these places. It depends on the receptor and all that. But what happens in, in the liver in particular, the T4 through the adenosine 1 goes to T3, the active form. And some of it through the adenosine 3 to the inactive form of T3. And that's what you always want to get the active form, the right. T3. You wanted to do the work. You wanted to metabolize the lipids in the liver and keep doing its job. In unhealthy liver, you have less T3. You get more inactive T3, RT3. There's beyond that, the lipid metabolism effects of the thyroid hormones. Right. Uh, as I said, I'm going to summarize them and I'm not talk about every single level, but it is de novo lipogenesis and th- synthesis. So they play thyroid hormone and thyroid hormone receptors play a major role. So we talked about fat, uh, uh, fat, uh, de novo lipogenesis and synthesis. Two, they play a role in free fatty acid oxidation through the mitochondria via a process called beta oxidation, which is crucial for NAFLD and NASH. And finally, the metabolism of cholesterol in the liver. Cholesterol comes in the liver, needs to be converted into bile acid, and it gets dumped in the bile. The thyroid hormones as well as the thyroid hormone receptor play a role in that as well. And finally, there's glucose metabolism regulation as well. It's really in the heart of the entire process of NASH. And as I mentioned, one of the major enzymes, HMG coenzyme, is regulated by multiple things. And that's include insulin, glucose, estrogen, and thyroid hormones. And there are data showing that thyroid hormones actually play the major role in its, its regulation. If I recall correctly, HMG coa is what's Statins regularly, yeah, right? That makes complete sense to me because we all learned 30 years ago that we thought antihistamines were the things that stopped you from sneezing until we found out that H2 was the thing in your sure, stomach that gave you sure, sure. So why is why is a thyroid hormone in the liver? The answer is why is histamine in the stomach? Yeah. Things wind up where they wind up. Here's the other question. You did a really nice job of demonstrating all the relationships that exist between the various metabolic diseases. This is key because it's a metabolic disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver and it's tightly connected with type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome. And indeed, if you look at the two diseases, with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, there's higher association as well as future increased risk of type 2 diabetes. The association with NAFLD and type 2 diabetes is up to 2.2 times. The other way around, if you have type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome, you're more likely to have risk of fibrosis in non-alcoholic fatty liver patients. Are there any causal relationships in this? It's mostly associations, and the underlying mechanisms as a cause are being studied. I'll give you an example. The inflammation, inflammatory status in the body. We know that NAFLD can cause that by itself. And if you have plagues in the heart, you don't want that systemic inflammation. So it makes things worse, right? Right. Same thing for obesity and and type 2 diabetes. It's inflammatory. uh, This is just an example. Inflammatory state that can lead to increased risk. I'm talking about NAFLD here in particular. The direct mechanisms to cause a heart disease as isolated risk factors are still being investigated. The the underlying question I would have if I were a doctor is, hey, 
I know how to treat diabetes. I know, I know how to get glycohemoglobin down. I know how to treat cholesterol. I know how to get your stand down. I know what to do about obesity. So if I'm doing all those things, why do I need to do this? A data has shown over and over that NAFOLD will come in univariate and multivariate analyses as a risk factor by itself, for instance, for cardiovascular disease. So we can say that based on univariate and multivariate analysis, the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is coming out as a risk factor. And thus it's suggested it has a cause yeah. and leads to cardiovascular disease. These are not merely a correlation matrix, but if you try to boil it down, the NAFLD pops out as predictive of the likelihood of having cardiovascular disease. I just want to mention one thing back. We talked extensively today about how the lipids are regulated in the liver through the different mechanisms. It happened when we talked about TH and THRs, beta and alpha or beta in particular for the liver. So it's plausible that you think that the liver is causing the heart disease through this abnormal or normal lipid metabolism because we know the whole thing starts from lipid and inflammation. So that's important. And the liver is is a main player and a major factory mm -hmm. for regulating all that lipids and glucose metabolism. And now back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please send an email to questions at surfingnash.com. We will be back next week with Stephen and Professor Quentin Anstey discussing what we've learned in the past year about non-invasive testing, histopathology, and best practices in diagnostics. Until then, stay safe and surf on. We'll see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now. This extra zone has been sponsored by Madrigal Pharmaceuticals, a clinical stage biopharmaceutical company pursuing novel therapeutics for NASH. Madrigal's lead candidate, Resmeterum, is a once-daily, oral, thyroid hormone receptor beta-selective agonist that is designed to target key underlying causes of NASH in the liver. Resmeterum is currently being evaluated in two Phase three clinical studies, Maestro NASH and Maestro NAFLD-1, designed to demonstrate multiple benefits in patients with NASH. For more information, visit www.madrigalpharma.com. <laughs>